Good morning, everyone. Good. Voice check works. We're good. <laughs> uh, my name is Reka Shinoy. I head up marketing and corporate development at Tripwire. And uh, certainly we see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of Tripwire customers, so welcome. Um, for Tripwire, connecting security to the business isn't a logo, it isn't a tagline, it isn't almost anything. It is a core value of where we believe we can serve our security customers. It is um, an area that we take very deeply, uh, very strongly, and you will see our engineers focused on it. You will hear our CEO talk about it at all levels in the organization. Uh, connecting security to the business has become um, an area that we uh, focus on very strongly. And, and why? You know, I think it's, it's data like this, which obviously for the, the, those of you in the room uh, is no new news because you're living it and you're breathing it and you're struggling with it in some respects. And we're seeing that with cybersecurity uh, challenges, whether it's the breaches, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, whatever the ways in which the business is waking up, they're asking questions and there's a level of scrutiny that's happening in security that probably hasn't happened at that level uh, over the 30 years that security has been part of our customers' ecosystem. And we're seeing that challenge every day in our conversations with our customers. That isn't a tool challenge. That isn't a, a technology challenge. That's a real uh, people process and every part of your ecosystem challenge in terms of protecting the business, right? IT and security are no longer about securing infrastructure. It's about mitigating risk for the business. And you always have a cost-benefit analysis in that. And you never do perfect security, you never do perfect risk, you align it with what the business needs. And in that world, the struggle we see is less about technology and more about communicating what security is doing to the business. The interesting thing about that story and, and the hundreds of CISOs that we've heard, we've heard their conversations, is uh, not only as a security professional having been in this industry for um, and hearing these stories for six years, um, I went through a similar situation with connecting with the business from a marketing perspective. And my journey was happening as I kept hearing our CISOs um, and their struggles. So granted, mar marketing is completely different from security and the challenges around security are different, but we had the same issue in the sense that um, we got to a point in our growth where marketing is considered a cost center. Those fluffy guys who put you know, posters out there, why am I spending my money? And it's everyone from finance to engineering that says, why is that extra dollar going there? So we're a cost center. We're uh, added baggage, depending on who you're talking to. And we're not business enablers. And that was the world we lived in for a period of time where every dollar spent was being scrutinized. And we went through the same challenge. And when, we t when I talked to my marketing team, certainly the struggle was, what do they know about this? You know, we would get questions like, why don't we just put all our money in Google ad spend? You know, things that it, would, it was the equivalent of what I heard from CISOs about, does our firewall work, <laughs> right, from a business owner? So you get these questions that are at a high level. They just want to know, am I secure and am I going to be in the newspaper? But at the deepest level, there's a lot of questions coming at you. And what we learned was we needed to come up with a common language that reflected what the business cared about. So don't assume you know what the business cares about. Try and understand that, right? So that was our first challenge. We spent about six to eight months creating that common vernacular and the common metrics. We identified how, when you think about the revenue at the end of the day that the company cares about, marketing fits in. And we built a, a, a metric that not only is it a, a metric that everyone from the board on down sees, but it's a metric that everyone in marketing understands now, and they hold themselves accountable to it. So we have monthly targets of both quality and quantity of leads that we provide to our sales team. And when it turns green, there is high-fiving and clapping and woohooing and all of that inside of the marketing team. And when they're red, it's very obvious which piece needs some help. And not only does 
Other parts of the organization come and help us with this. If it is a web issue, then we've got events people trying to help out and, and vice versa. Um, but there's such a high level of visibility into the issues that uh, we're holding our piece of the bargain and um, everyone from the board and the CEO on down know what we're doing about it. And then about nine months ago, this unbelievably unnatural thing happened, which if you've talked to um, CISOs, they've never seen it, and I've never seen it as a marketing professional. We were having a blowout quarter, okay? And what happens typically in technology companies when you have a blowout quarter? You put more money in engineering. That's just what we do, and we, I would support that too as a, a corporate citizen. But they, all of a sudden, my CEO and CFO come by and they say, we've seen your metrics, we've seen your numbers, they're looking really good, what would you do if I gave you another million dollars? And that was business enablement, right? I, I couldn't believe it. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen all the time. I also have the other side of it. Can I cut another million dollars, right? We all have that world. But we had crossed that chasm from being a cost center and something that just happens on the side, and we can't connect it to all this wonderful revenue thing that we focus on. And we had crossed that chasm to being business enablers. And that story, I find, um, is so similar to all of the stories I'm hearing from CISOs who are making that, uh, that transformation. It's not the next best cool security technology that's making that transformation for them. It's the ways in which they communicate and the ways in which they align with the business need that's causing that transformation. So this morning, I want to talk about three specific things. One. What are those metrics? What are those things that um, CISOs are trying to evolve and develop for their non-technical business counterparts and what's working, right? But again, that's, that's just step one. It's only meaningful if that metric is measured continuously and it's actually showing meaningful improvement. And many, many of you have been in that situation where the metric's there and it's obvious but you can't get alignment with a business unit, with an IT operations team, or, or several other teams that you don't manage and own. How do you leverage that metric to influence the organization to be more risk-focused? Uh, risk How do you create that environment where risk is part of that conversa conversation and security is part of that conversation? And by the way, they all have day jobs. Why do they care? Right? How do you create that, um, that environment? So that's the second part of the conversation. And then the third one, especially for Tripwire customers in the room, uh, you're probably wondering, I thought I know you guys. Um, aren't you guys my PCI guys? <laughs> aren't you guys my file integrity monitoring guys? So let me connect the dots for you with regard to who Tripwire is today. And we're not, we're not the complete solution. You guys are the, are the guys in battle. You're the ones driving those things. We want to enable you, and we'll talk about how we help you with that. Okay. Okay. So here's the story that we hear. This is your story, right? The CISOs are struggling with um, answering questions like, what's the most meaningful security metric for the business? And we've even had conversations where people say, there's just one magical metric. What is that one magical metric? And, and, and you're struggling with questions like that. Um, how are we compared to our peers? And, and most common question I've heard is, um, we see a lot of activity when a competitor gets breached. Is that going to happen to us? How many of you have seen that? And, and I've also heard CISOs who basically said that's what funded the budget. So there's the goodness of that question. But it's going to be, what are you going to do with my dollar if I give it to you, right? How do you know that you're safe and you're secure? And then have we properly invested in it, right? How many of us have been in that shelfware situation? We took the trouble, we invested in it, and then there's nobody running it. Or it's actually not driving change. John, we should talk more. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, and so, by the way, here's another story. Um, I, we were joking that we said, you know, the breach happens, what's the first thing people buy? And uh, this is an internal uh, conversation, and we were saying, I think the first thing they buy is a firewall. 
And I said, what's the second thing they buy? Maybe a next generation firewall, right? And, <laughs> and we were joking about how simple we've made the problem when there's a really a bigger issue around business risk, identifying where the risk is and then mitigating the risk that you actually care about from a business perspective. And here's a simple answer by a firewall. Well, we were chuckling about that, and we, uh, my CFO and I said, hey, we should see what we do. We're a $150 million company. We've got the same risk. Let's take a look. And what was the first thing our CISO bought? A firewall. <laughs> so, and a next generation one, too. <laughs> um, but that's why we, we as a security organization need to grow up, right? Uh, part of it is it's not a bad thing, but that's not a security strategy. And now you got to educate a non-technical team around the security strategy. So let's talk about those metrics. And as I learned in my exercise uh, with marketing, um, I hear so many stories where CISOs are taking a lesson from the book of CFOs. Okay, so here's a person who has a very technical job. He's got he or she has a long list of reports like this, uh, long list of uh, you know metrics that uh, many of them only he cares about, but to a large extent, everyone understands a handful of metrics. And the point about these metrics is. People aren't arguing about what the word revenue means, okay? And it's not just they're not arguing inside the company, they're not arguing outside the company. When we compare re revenue of company X versus com company Y, it's the same number. We haven't gotten to that level with security and risk. The second thing is, here's a person who's accountable and needs to know that number daily, weekly, monthly, and, and be able to share it at a deep level. And when that number doesn't look good, that person knows how to turn on the business and say, hey, let's go focus on this, let's fix that. So that, to us, was the starting point of what do you learn from this? And how do you build objective metrics like they, are, like they do? And one of the missions that Tripwire has is to start de delivering that, you know, creating that community where we have these consistent metrics that uh, really drive uh, behavior across the organization. Okay, once again. So we started talking to, uh, obviously, Paul Proctor here at Gartner and, and several other um, industry-leading thinkers, and, and there's some simplicity to some of these points. The metric has to be objective and measurable, okay? One of the things we tend to do in security is think more project-oriented. For this project, here's the one goal. You gotta do that, that's true. But when you're talking to the business, you're talking about something that's objective and consistently measured, okay? That means things like trend lines, up, down, happy, sad, and by the way, uh, the business understands that. You know, something that was supposed to go up went down, okay, now we know we need to care. It's gotta be that simple. Um, and metrics like ratios and percentages make a lot more sense than number of vulnerabilities or number of uh, failed logins. Those kinds of things give you a relative score, and then you can start trending in different directions. And the key piece that we learned that almost was so simple in front of us, but all of us in security were not focused on, is business context. I've seen customers that have really done a lot in moving the needle with their business partners with this concept of business context, okay? So think of the number of times you've talked about um, Take something that's very typical of us in, sec in security. We have uh, 10,000 Windows boxes to patch. There is no business context there. And by the way, if we didn't patch it, what would happen? What, what, if, what are we affecting? There's really no data in that, in that statement right there. Or another 5,000 Linux boxes that um, are misconfigured. What does that mean? And what we found was that there are companies at, that are really focused on that and said, how about we roll things up into business context? Let's talk about the risk of our supply chain management system, and let's show you what that looks like. And by the way, those patches and those issues are all rolled up into that view of the world. And by the way, if we don't ever get to our HR systems or our print servers, fine, right? That's how you kind of start focusing on the right set of things, and then you're measuring it that way. Now, what if your solutions actually gave you data that way? That would change uh, the story right there. So let's talk about an example. 
the supply chain. Many of you have been in a conversation where um, it's a business uh, owner who's driving a conversation. The metrics they're thinking about are, you know, time to revenue, cost savings, uh, days to, uh, you know, qualification, those kinds of things that are all business driven and you're scratching your head going, so how do I throw in my metric in here? My metrics don't look anything like that, right? And there's a reason for that. You're the security expert in the room. Your world doesn't look like this. Your world looks like this, right? Your world looks like all of those supply chain uh, uh, por uh, partner portal uh, assets are inside your walls, inside your data center, outside, in a cloud, not to mention that it's being managed remotely. And now you're asking, um, your, your business is asking you to connect it to vendors that you have no access to. That's what that looks like to you. And so how do you provide meaningful metrics to a team that's really focused on revenue and time to revenue? And then the questions they're asking are more about availability and less about risk. Well, there's an easy answer, right? The easy answer is your competitor who just did this got breached. <laughs> but we've got to do better than that. And, and when you think about this and you say, okay, how do we attack this? You start breaking it down into parts that look like this. And you go, where are all of my assets that are related to my supply chain? What are they related to? And by the way, don't assume you know the answers to that. And when you start poking into it, you identify all of the challenges that you have in front of you. So your world looks like assets. It looks like how are they hardened and configured, probably, step one. And then how vulnerable are they and what are we doing about it? And what you bump into isn't just technology. Now you're struggling with organizations that own these pieces separately. And now you're trying to influence an organization. So with that kind of a daunting challenge, I wouldn't take lightly the importance of, of metrics that help you move the needle. Right? And so you come back to this issue and you focus on building out a security project and you start prioritizing the technologies that fit into this, focused on what are you gonna do within the data center, within the other parts of the ecosystem, how is the network topology supporting it or not. You start considering things like the SLAs you're signing up for and the availability. That's what you gotta do. That's the security project, but that's not your security metric, okay? And that's what we found a lot of customers struggling with is that they've got this nailed. They figured out what the security need is, and yet there's a business owner who just doesn't understand it, and they look at it as a, you know, a shopping list that you showed up with. And that's what changes. So if I gave you this, this is where the CEO comes in and says, if I gave you this, and you, get, you asked for whatever million dollars for it, what do I get? And you don't have the metric that proves that out. Right? So sometimes we've seen customers that say, hey, we're seeing uh, this kind of uh, login failures, this kind of attacks from Russia and China. We're seeing this kind of uh, uh, poor patching behavior within this organization and so on. Uh, but what the CEO is asking for is really skip the jargon do I trust you as my CISO to know what that means and tell me when um, things are moving up and to the right? So the dashboard looks more like something like this. And we've had this conversation with a lot of customers and what that metric means in, di uh, in different customer situation is different. And we've actually got real implementations that work. But <clears throat> there's two things about it. One, know your facts. You, you know it but what you're not doing is bubbling it up into something that's meaningful. And by the way, when you build this out, and when you have this, what we find is the most um, valuable tool to a CISO is Excel. And the number of man hours you put in to make this work is, is a lot, right? And that's what we, we've seen as the struggle for our, uh, for our customers. You know, if we can even take half that load off your plate by providing you the business context out of the box, if we can provide it across multiple controls, we're not saying we're solving all your problems, but hopefully we're taking on a big part of that burden. But then the journey is about how you 
use this to sell what security could be in that organization. It's about what risk management could be in that organization. If you get to the point where you've actually gotten a meaningful discussion around what that metric is, then what you're doing now is a different problem. Now you're looking, you're shining a light on all of the security challenges inside the company. Your battle number two starts, right? Which is how do I influence the organization to fix it? Especially the, the parts of the organization that don't report into you. So let's talk about that, which is how do you connect security to the business? And that we've had, um, I have Cindy up here who um, uh, has, how many CISOs are your friend now? <laughs> but we've heard personal stories about how, you know, this has been a struggle, all of the challenges that they've had, and some really great success stories as well. Um, here's one that uh, hopefully gives you an idea of how to do it. Our CISO John is really good. I mean, the way he protects his company and its information. I mean, I've been watching him for months. I take the protection part of my job very seriously. The things he can do, the way he adapts to new situations, how quickly he reacts to new threats. Okay, here's the deal. It's not human. I mean, like, alien, not human. Clint has a very active imagination. Irrefutable. How are you not going to believe that? <laughs> Staged. John Powers came here 43 months after an asteroid crashed in Cleveland, which is only 487 miles away from here. Coincidence? I don't think so. I think John Powers has a secret. The secret is having the right tools to see the big picture. Last week, we had a disgruntled employee whose login wasn't disabled the way it was supposed to be. That was Clint's fault. May or may not have been my fault, but the point is, John shut it down before it ever happened, like in the middle of the night. It's like the guy doesn't sleep. And I'm listening in the music and I'm not looking at you like you're an alien and I gotta get out of here if I'm fighting, fighting, fighting. You know who else doesn't sleep? Hey, Clint, I was just mm -hmm. checking uh, yeah. wh when you'd be finished with the report. Oh, soon. Good. Yeah. All right. 10 4. Thanks. Yeah. Tripwire IT Security Management. Confidence secured. He's communicating with the mothership. about this is uh, how this so resonates with all of us, right? The idea that the way to kind of conquer this is you really do need to be an alien. <laughs> um, the CISO of um, a major credit card company who's really made great strides, he's done a lot to, you know, risk management is a practice that's actually invested in and focused on at their company. Uh, naturally, by being a credit card vendor, you know, they have to be. But even he said, the first time I'm in a business conversation, I say no. I worry about not being invited again. Okay, that's really the world we live in. And the, you know, the powerful alien uh, CISO is uh, pretty cool and aspirational for who we are. And uh, part of what we're trying to do is be part of the community and, uh, and, and you know, sort of resonate with uh, the challenges. But let's talk about this issue about, okay, so we're shining a light on the security challenges. We've created these metrics. Um, 
We've created different kinds of metrics depending on the business initiative, and we've really started being able to produce this information continuously. So continuous monitoring is, is core to how we think about things. But once you do that, what you're seeing is there's three layers of uh, the organization that need to understand it differently and, and drive the, uh, the process improvements that really uh, improve security for you. So we think about it this way. We call this the layer cake. Um, there's the users. Let's think about their world, right? Their goal is they're overloaded. They're doing more with less. They're not necessarily subject matter experts in everything, depending on where you are. You've got security experts, and then you've got other people who have operations roles that don't necessarily need to be experts, but now they've got security you know, responsibilities. And they tend to think of it as prioritize my work, keep my job. Right? How can I get the uh, most improvements and then get it off my plate? And in their world, those same metrics probably look more like systems tests, incidents, breaches. Right? They're specific, almost um, to-do lists. And in that world, if you with this metric, you want them to influence that because, remember, once you've decided with your CEO that you're going to show him a metric continuously, there's only one direction he wants to hear about, right? Up and to the right. So how are you going to get up and to the right when you've got a team that's focused on this? So I believe that the solution is all about prioritization. So that's what you do. So here's some examples of real customer uh, scenarios that they've used to help prioritize. So we've got customers that have taken all of their security information and divided it up by region. We've got other customers that have created by business unit. They've got supply chain versus uh, consumer business versus other things. So um, they build it out that way. And then they start b breaking down the numbers. Uh, and, and the most meaningful thing is the column on the, on the right, which is about the percentage change. And we've got customers that do it quarterly, that do it daily, that do it monthly, depending on what makes sense for them. But once you start seeing those little red arrows, you go drill into it and you can start breaking it out by layer. Now it becomes more meaningful. There's customers that take the layer column and replace that with the owner. And when you look at the layer and you look at it this way, we can drill it down even further and, and start seeing a little bit of a, a more detail and you say, oh, if my job is to get up and to the right, I probably get the biggest bang for the buck if I focus on SQL Server, right? And so now you start seeing this. Um, the CISO at a um, chocolate manufacturing company, he's just a, a great um, thought leader, uh, he looked at this and he said, you know what? This helps me manage by competition. Let's share the information with everyone, and you don't want to be the guy with the 21 and the down arrow right there. And how do we make that happen? And it's meaningful, because when those things get improved, your number starts ticking up. But then when you look at it from the, um, the SQL Server guy who needs to fix this problem, what he wants to see, come on, is probably something more like this. Where do I get the biggest bang for the buck, right? What are my top failing nodes and what do I got to do about it? And we found customers that go a step deeper and say, what are my top failing critical nodes? And there are companies that have actually rewarded you for leaving the non-critical nodes alone and said, you focused on the most critical things, you proved it, right? And so that same business context that drove the, the CEO picture starts driving the, the, uh, the pieces on the bottom. So you got the same concept up and down, and you get, you get benefit from focusing on the critical things, and you can leave a lot of other things behind. But here's the other side of it. You know, we're talking about directors and managers who really got to make this happen. And what we're seeing is the conversation is, is more about um, influence, about managing across, about having conversations with business units that really aren't interested in some respects, have heard you say no, are likely to not invite you again, right? And, and really start communicating the value of this and uh, managing across. So, in this situation, trends, oversight, budget, all of those pieces make a lot of sense. And what you see is we have a customer that uses this scorecard approach. It's a really cool um, idea that um, 
is driven more by the behavior and what happens when these numbers become this. So there is a target for what their scores need to be uh, that was agreed to all the way from uh, the top, and all of the business owners understand what that means. And once a month, this scorecard is produced and shared with each of the business units, and there's 25 of them. And what they saw is, so now everyone sees this, and when your scores dip below a certain range, your bonuses are affected. And that's alignment. The business cared. They, they actually put, helped you with uh, measures. And you can see on the right, it's, it's got the trends out there as well. If it was getting better and got worse, it's a different story from, um, you know, um, if you've been flat for a very long time. So the time that you've invested in making it, you get rewarded for it. But the two things they found that was really interesting that, um, you know, this management by competition that I talked about, is that um, two business units at the top were consistently the two on the top. And their numbers got better and better by a point or two all the time because they just wanted to be number one. <laughs> and every, qu every quarter it would be one or the other or whatever. But the guys at the bottom, they didn't get any, you know, they didn't go to the top, but their numbers improved the most. And they went, they had 20 point improvements in that situation. And that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about really aligning um, the business and, and giving them enough metrics that they can actually go do something with. Do you expect the CEO or CFO to know exactly what security solutions were in there? Do you expect them to understand whether it was a patch that improved the score or whether it was a, a vulnerability that was remediated or whether it was a policy compliance failure or whatever? You don't. But security does. IT operations does, and those business units that are holding themselves accountable to, they get it. And now there's a stick and a carrot uh, to make them successful. And this is another example, a lot simpler, of uh, what some companies have done to kind of show this is a point in time. And this is a trending way of sh uh, showing you how, um, how things are improving. Um, a major software manufacturer leverages this on a regular basis, and um, they've actually shown a line that consistently stays below 50%. And the reason that that's perfectly okay for them is because those are their internal systems that don't connect to anything related to their um, online properties. And to them, they wanted to show the business that we're using your investment wisely and we're leaving alone things that you don't need to. And it was just as much a, a badge of honor, the, the, the line that was on the bottom, as much as the ones on top. And they showed meaningful improvement across the board. And what was really interesting is they didn't look at it as a static number because they expect change to happen. They expect that the business will grow, they will scale, and there'll be new systems that will consistently be part of this effort. And as new systems come in, if they f fit into the bottom one, they leave it alone. If it fits into the top one, there's people who are focused on actually securing it because they don't want their numbers to go down because of new systems. So it created that sense of accountability across the organization. But then here's another operational report that a lot of them use, which is about, um, so if I have an issue, where's my, where do I focus? So you can look at it by service, you can look at it by application, geography, or owner, and it should be immensely easy for you to tag it that way, for you to be able to slice and dice it that way. We don't walk in assuming we know the ways in which it makes sense for you, but once you do know that, you should be able to find it this way. And a lot of people use this sort of, okay, I really want to go find Michael down there and, and focus on his issues, right? And what I found, one, um, one CISO said that if I had this report on my iPad and I was walking around and everyone knew I had it, that's kind of like um, being the Jedi with the, uh, with the sword. You know, that's a weapon that now all of a sudden makes me um, someone they would fear. Because there's a lot of ways to bury the challenges, and if you can't prove it and you don't have the information, you don't have up-to-date information, you, you really you know there's a problem, but you can't prove it. And you spend a lot of time chasing that down. But if you had something like this, and it was continuous and it was real, you could really start influencing the organization. 
And, and here's another way that we've seen some customers use our, our data. And, uh, you know, where is the challenge? Which controls do I really care about? We use uh, the right controls for the right needs, and then let's focus on the ones that uh, may be more critical than others. So maybe access control is, is the challenge right now. We know how to think about that differently from uh, maybe anti-malware coverage or um, just policy failures, um, configuration audit failures. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, once I get to the, the number just went down, um, we need to provide um, CISOs and directors and, and all the way down to the uh, administrators tools that can help them diagnose it fairly quickly and then take action. But the point, again, is about the business, right? Am I secure and can you prove it? And I've heard a lot of stories where can you prove it was more important than am I secure in some situations. Um, I had a customer that told me that um, there's more conversations about the standard of due care. So if a breach happens, did the company do everything that it could to make sure that uh, they protected customer data? And if they didn't, then the, the liability and the lawsuits were more expensive than whatever was stolen in the breach. And that comes squarely into the purview of a CISO who needs to be able to answer that question. Did we do everything we could to prevent it from happening in the first place? And if you've got reliable data, it takes you a long way. And how do we start answering those questions for a business owner who will never be as deep technical security as, as we need to be? And so it's that, so these are the kinds of reports that we talked about that really start driving that. And then when those are connected back to all of those reports that people use, you start seeing that change. And you know, none of this stuff happens overnight. This is culture change in a lot of situations. They are challenges. Um, when we started building these out and we started seeing customers and how they would use it, we ourselves had like, you know, a mini microcosm of what? Really? People want this? Um, when we built that one on the left, um, we had engineers saying, you don't even know what 88 is. I mean, come on, this is too simple. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Who would want to use it? And um, we were shopping it around and sharing it with other people. and. Our CFO, who consistently tells everyone that he's not a technologist, his last job was selling scrap metal in a you know scrap metal industry, and he he's, makes that a point to say he's not technical. He looks at this and he says, "Finally, I understand what you're talking about." And we said, "What did you understand?" And, and the thing that was most meaningful to him was the fact that, assuming that we've agreed on what the metrics mean, assuming that that common definition has been done. You're telling me that we've made meaningful progress on the, the green arrow. I can leave that one alone. And, and now I have an area to focus, that red, red dot. And his comment was, you now gave me a starting point for a meaningful conversation. What do you need in order to make that successful? Do you need more dollars? Do you need more focus? Do you, need, you have regions that aren't focused on you, or that aren't investing? What do you need? Right? It's less about what did you do for me and then taking the fall for all of the challenges, but more about what do you need to in order to f solve the problem. And he said, if I had that, I would know where to start in my conversations with my CISO. So, and we've seen that over and over that um, you need to get there. I'm not trivializing the challenge of getting to that point, that metric that makes sense for you and your business owner. But once you have that, a key piece is it's got to be continuous. It's got to be ongoing. And it's got to be meaningful and driving change, which is what allows us to start building our risk management practice. And the challenges all of you are having around building this, you know, is, is something that uh, we're watching very closely and, and looking to help. So the, these were our learnings from our journey with our um, best customers. Um, start with the business initiative and the goals. That's a really good starting point. And very often we've heard people who said, I assumed it was X. And when I had a conversation with the business owner, I found, I found out more. I understood better. Um, identify the infrastructure critical to the business initiative. And uh, we all know that's not a trivial task. That's a challenge right there. And you've got to start prioritizing based on that. Apply foundational controls. That's 
motherhood and apple pie, but it really is something that we don't see people focused on. Um, and then link it to those security metrics. And if you can get that far, you're already 50% or more ahead of the, the rest of the security industry. And then leverage them to influence the organization. We are absolutely seeing thought leaders in this area, and we think that they're really the way in which it, uh, the market's going to move. You're clearly hearing that from Gartner and, and others in terms of what it's going to take to um, get it done. And then communicate, right? Your ability to communicate that and to drive um, a, a culture behind that is what's going to change that tide. So how can we help? This is the part of the vendor pitch where I tell you about the vendor, so bear with me. Um, many of you are hopefully Tripwire customers, and you've heard that um, we had a major acquisition. We acquired Encircle about 60 days ago. Uh, Encircle. So um, uh, we've certainly uh, broadened our portfolio pretty significantly. Um, want to share a little bit more about our thinking around that as well as uh, what that means for you guys. And uh, for those of you that are customers of ours, please come on by later on. I'm happy to share more, more detail. But this is who we believe we are. This is our vision for who we want to be. We want to be the leading provider of risk-based security and compliance, enabling you to connect security to the business. So I started off saying connect security to the business is, uh, is something that is deep and meaningful across the organization. It really is. But the way we do that is by having the broadest set of foundational security controls. We want to deliver that to you. Uh, and each one of them are tied by a thread about this business context. And the reason to do that is the challenges that you're facing with regard to integrating silos of security uh, technologies. And if we can tie them together and we can provide this common thread of asset and risk scoring that's tied back to business context, the way you defined it. Define it once, and all of our technologies will start absorbing and providing you intelligence based on that. And then on top of it, we want to provide you a layer of business intelligence that helps you make decisions. So it's not the dashboard in the sky. It's not just the one that you use to answer questions for a CEO, maybe. But it's really about now tying that back to all of those things that drive the workflow and the metrics and the operational changes that you need in order to drive that, uh, that um, security practice. And then the, th the last piece was we have a deep understanding of what your enterprises look like today and in the future. It's not just the data center. It's not just the mission critical systems. We're talking about your uh, enterprises moving into the cloud and as well as moving into vendor uh, infrastructure that you don't have control over. So we see that as a challenge, and our challenge is really supporting you all the way. So the way we do that is we believe that we need to start by connecting security to the business. So our tools and our ability to start providing you business context is, is back to that. That's almost the starting block for us. The next step is providing you the best controls. And today, with the Encircle acquisition, we deliver the top four of the SANS critical controls. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. And then it's always got to be continuous. So if there's any of you here in the federal government, continuous monitoring. In some situations, it might mean monthly reports. That's still progress over that sort of audit mentality about check it once and then move on, right? This, this, Continuous detection across the enterprise is, is a key tenant of who we uh, believe we need to be. And the way we do that is by helping you cover your enterprise with all the controls you need. We expect that you will deploy file integrity monitoring on probably 10 to 20 percent of your infrastructure on the most mission critical ones, the ones that shouldn't change the ones that shouldn't have unauthorized access, the ones that shouldn't have um, anything that affects availability or SLAs, um, and of course, the ones that have the, the, the critical data. We expect that you will cover your entire enterprise, including your business partners, and assess the vulnerability across all of them. In fact, before you even do that, you will have discovery and ability to know exactly what's everywhere, right? So we expect that you will deploy it that way. We expect that you'll collect the logs from almost everything, and you will leverage it to, you know, to do analytics and, and support your security operations center, but that's for everything. 
And when you think about policy compliance, we have this conversation about focusing on the critical pieces. We expect that you will cover some of them with security configuration management. But the piece that's common across all of them goes back to you actually know what's in your system. You know your enterprise. You have your assets, and they're prioritized based on the business context you committed to with your customers. And then when you pull these pieces together, you have these, uh, these reports and dashboards. And it tells you what your trends and progress are. It run, helps you run things this way, and it gives you an ability to compare you to others. And if we could do that with the controls that we have, we certainly have aspirations to start helping you do that with other controls that we don't own. So we're certainly looking to do more. At, at, at today, we're focused on our controls. Um, which are really about the SANS uh, top 20. You know, me, many of you are very familiar with SANS, and I've heard, you know, there's the pro and the uh, con against SANS. But you, at the goal level, you can't disagree with the fact that you got to know your inventory of your hardware. You got to know what's on it. You got to configure them so that they're hardened. And I tend to think of configurations as all the little doors and windows in your enterprise that are wide open and make it easy to um, access. Those are the things you should just know. And then you got to uh, do your vulnerability assessment. And we've got the complete solution for those pieces. We, we cover 14 of the top 20, but our focus is to provide you the best solutions for the top four of the SAMS controls. And what our solutions look like today is this is our product portfolio. So many of you know and love us for our file integrity monitoring solution. With the Encircle acquisition, we've got the ability to do both agent-based and agent-less security configuration management and file integrity monitoring. And when we did our assessment and due diligence on the fact that we've got two technologies, we talked to our customers, and we found that you would really need both of those in order to cover your enterprise. There are scenarios where you want deep analytics and in other scenarios where you don't. And our, our mission is to integrate those two. With vulnerability management, we're really excited about IP360 and what it can add to our uh, portfolio. It came in with the same philosophy that we had. That was the big surprise or the icing on the cake was when we started talking about connecting security to the business, um, the IP360 team said, Sounds like us. What's new? You just create an acronym called Connect Security Business. It's who we thought we were. So that, that uh, appliance has consistently served enterprises and scaled and grown with, uh, with our enterprise customers. And now we have the ability with Pure Cloud to uh, extend into other e parts of customers' ecosystems. So if you're an enterprise that is leveraging IP360, um, with Pure Cloud, you can assess uh, remote offices without having an appliance. You can assess uh, partners. Um, we have a card provider that is actually leveraging Pure Cloud to assess three million of their uh, vendors. Um, and, um, you know, those use cases, or maybe branch offices or remote offices that, that you may need to. So adding on that capability to really cover your extended enterprise, we're seeing that. With our log solution, um, we have a, a really solid solution for log management, but um, one of the things we got consistently is you got a reliable agent. We would like reliable log collection on Windows servers, which we know is really hard to do, uh, but also with other servers that are in possibly sort of a, a part of the network that doesn't give you reliable collection. So we will have a brand new um, agent coming out in, in the fall uh, that is about advanced reliable log collection that you can leverage with any other security event manager out there. So when we uh, roll it up, these are our products. Um, Obviously, we're 60 days into our integration. Um, the surprising um, good thing about our acquisition, and we, all of us have been through many of them, you know the challenges in front of it. I'm really excited about the fact that we have a roadmap about how these integrations are going to come together. And um, our uh, product management team really has been spending a lot of time on the road talking to our customers and making sure that um, it resonates, it fits with your plans, and then we support you 
through this integration. So um, let me throw it out there for you if you are uh, either an InCircle customer or a Tripwire customer, and uh, this is intriguing, and uh, you may have either concerns or specific areas of interest. We would be more than happy to reach out to you and uh, do a roadmap deep dive. So with that, I want to thank you for uh, spending uh, the time with us, and uh, come find us. Thank you.